I think that's it. All right. So uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, uh, depending where you may be from the world. Um, welcome to the fifth Bender Spotlight uh, MSP Geekcast that has happened this year. Um, today, we have got Scout Cybersecurity um, talking well about what they know, and uh, hopefully they can impart some of that knowledge onto you. And um, today we've, we've got Eric Russo, um, SOC manager, uh, as well as James Mason, the sales engineer from Scout, and myself, Michael Priest, um, one of the co-founders co -founders of MSP Geek, and as well as a member of the admin team, along with the other lovely members we have. So I don't want to hold, um, <laughs> hold everyone up, and I'd rather let us get Scout to uh, get started. However, Scout have said today that they would like to make this an interactive session and to, and if you have um, any questions at all during this presentation, please put them into the chat and we'll get around to answering them as soon as possible. So with that, let me pass it on to uh, James and he can get started. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, you know, uh, I am joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Eric, um, who is our SOC manager, as Michael said, and uh, you know, leads up our, our team of SOC engineers uh, here at Scout. Um, but um, let's give you a little bit of background around Scout uh, and kind of lay the, the picture and lay the scene as to who we are. Um, so we're a, a channel only provider of cybersecurity. Um, and our cybersecurity stack kind of encompasses five major solutions. And I, I promise you, this is as salesy as I'm going to get. And I'm going to keep it as light as humanly possible. <laughs> um, but we have the five solutions. The, so it's log security monitoring and network security monitoring. So it's covering like infrastructure, uh, able to ingest logs and network traffic and make sure we're looking for all the bad stuff that may be happening on the network. We have the 365 security monitoring piece. Um, so that allows us to go in and uh, look at the back end logs of 365, email protection, looking at the emails coming in themselves, making sure there's no bad stuff there. Um, and then finally, the endpoint protection, um, you know, the actual physical protection of, of the laptops and desktops and things like that. Um, now, Scout's been around for a little while now. And uh, in that time, we have set ourselves up as kind of a SOC and SIEM provider. Um, with uh, the, the SOC kind of being the, the one-stop shop for all things cybersecurity related. Um, the ability to call us 24 by 7 by 365 and get through to a human being um, that is you know, part and parcel of Scout's uh, not only team, but core values uh, to make sure that we're you know, all working together for one singular goal of getting customers out of the fire, proverbial fire, uh, and into a good workable state afterwards. And you can see we, we've been recognized by a, a few of the uh, uh, top publications and, and top uh, awards out there uh, within the MSP space. And you know, like I said, we are channel only. So you know, we've been focused uh, entirely on the channel for quite some time, protecting small to medium businesses out there. Um, so yeah, I guess we can uh, move on into uh, today's agenda. Eric, I don't know if you wanted to kind of cover through this. Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. Um, so the topics that we'll be talking about and the discussions we'll be having are primarily around what does the cyber attack landscape look like today, um, which we'll get into. There's a lot to discuss there. Um, some potential attack vectors and ramifications of supply chain attacks specifically, which I think we know has made a lot of uh, news recently. Um, specifically with Sunburst, and we'll discuss that specific compromise. And then, um, yeah, we'd love to hear some questions and do a little Q&A at the end and answer anything that might be on your minds. Perfect. Um, so I guess let's open up on the, the threat landscape and what it looks like today and, and kind of talk through that. Um, Eric and I have unique positions um, within cybersecurity. Um, and, you know, a little background from myself, I, 16 years now in IT um, is kind of a, a generalist, then moving into infrastructure, into uh, infrastructure design, data center engineer, things like that. I've 
kind of done a few different jobs. And now I sit solely in the role of the sales engineer, which uh, is kind of best of both worlds. Um, and then with Eric, obviously leading our SOC, um, you know, we both have that unique perspective into the landscape. We get to see and live on the forefront of cybersecurity and see what's happening out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we probably both have a very similar answer, right, Eric, around this. Um, uh, I guess from my side of things, I always look at this as a really interesting kind of almost like a, a, a never ending circle or the, you know, the snake that eats its own tail. Um, you know, you can use any different attack vector, any different attack type or any different technology um, uh, setup or, or standing. And it always seems to just kind of do this never ending loop. Um, you know, I always love the thought of like, when you look at technology as a whole, way back when, um, you know, everything was stored on a, a mainframe and you had dumb terminals connecting in to access that data. Then some clever so-and-so decided, oh, no, 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 we want all the data locally. I need it all on my, my personal machine. Uh, and then all of a sudden they were like, well, no, that's actually terrible. We need to store it on cloud servers or, or you know, ho you know uh, data centers or hosted infrastructure, anything like that. So it's kind of that, that circle of, of things going back around again, you know, and everyone's machines are getting lighter and lighter and get Chromebooks and MacBook Airs and things like that. Um, and I think that holds true within cybersecurity as well, where we're looking at, you know, a landscape that as much as it's changing dramatically, um, you know, and it's it's trying to keep up with it is is somewhat impossible. But you know, that's why it's not down to a singular person. Uh, we have you know teams of people that look into this, and you get to look at some really interesting attack vectors and attack types. And I always love um, I love love and hate <laughs> ransomware uh, for obvious reasons, the hatred. Uh, but my love of it kind of stems from its simplicity. Um, you know, when we look at how ransomware started way back when, um, you know, it was an ASCII conference, God only knows how long ago, uh, where they were talking about this kind of idea of holding data to ransom using powerful encryption methodology. And then in 1989, um, there was a, uh, a, a professor that was looking into um, the AIDS virus and, and trying to find a cure for that, that realized that he can use his name as power. So we're talking early days social engineering here but he could use his name his power his title to convince people to do a set of skills or do a set of uh, um, uh, events and that really was i'm going to send out this you know the, the big old floppy disk where floppies actually came from because they were actually floppy um he sent out a ton of those uh, with a little letter attached to them and said hey you know i'm doctor i, I forget what his name is dr so-and-so um you want to look at this information I'm, I'm putting in this uh, floppy disk. Um, you know, it'll teach you how to prevent, how to, you know, help with the cure and things like that. Uh, and once someone put that into their personal computer and ran that, it encrypted. And it was a, a terrible little encryption. Like you could have broken it with one of today's computers at about, you know, a nanosecond. Um, but for the time, this was groundbreaking. The less groundbreaking side of this was the fact that he put, hey, you know, I will give you the decryption key if you send me money. And he put his personal address on there. Um, so lo and behold, very quickly, the FBI were at his door and uh, telling him that he was very, very bad. And, you know, they wanted to have some uh, very uncomfortable words with him. Um, and I think, you know, that when we look at it from that side of things, you know, that was a very well-engineered attack again you know using social engineering using powerful at the time powerful encryption and using fear to instill into people and then you look at the landscape today it's exactly the same you know we're using social engineering fear incredibly powerful encryption these days you know rsa 4096 and, and the such like um but no longer are we just worried about the local now we're looking at you know that data being siphoned off and, and threatened to be sold on the dark web, which, you know, it's, it's, it's wild to see how things have progressed and, you know, more attacks coming out day in, day out. We saw the colonial pipeline attack recently, a very nasty ransomware attack that really brought a lot of uh, states to almost a standstill, um, you know, panic buying of, of gasoline, um, you know, it, it got pretty wild, you know, um, 
I'm up in I'm up in Connecticut in the US, and the the worst we saw was an inflated price of gas. <laughs> you know, it sucks, but it, it's not the end of the world for us for sure. But you know, it, it's it's wild to see, and it's quite funny the fact that that, that uh, attack group actually turned around and apologized because they didn't realize that pipelines are actually uh, it's a critical infrastructure, and that gets you uh, up to one of the top places in the FBI uh, most wanted list. Uh, so they were like, oh, we're sorry, um, you know, but kind of too little too late there. So, um, but yeah, I, the landscape for me, you know, the ever changing premise of it and you know, the newer attack types, I kind of touched on ransomware there kind of entirely, I realize. Um, Eric, what are you seeing uh, over in your, your camp? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, James. And I agree with everything you said, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, the more the cyber landscape is changing, um, you know, we're talking about new threat vectors like supply chain attacks, um, more complex threat vectors, I should say. Um, we're seeing some of the largest organizations in the world who we assume have top-notch security, they're now being impacted. So um, the more the cyber landscape changes and becomes more complex on the same end, um, it really stays the same. What we've been seeing a lot of, and we talk about this often in our security operations center, are really the two top threat vectors we see have been the same for a year, maybe more at this point, which are business email compromise and ransomware, which James, you've talked a lot of it about. And, um, you know, really what we often see is that the two are tied together, where you'll receive a phishing email, which in the end leads to an account being compromised, which leads to access to the network and a ransomware being installed, or as simple as a phishing email containing an attachment with ransomware um, embedded in, a, in some sort of macro or what have you. Um, so we see a lot of those two specifically. And like I said, they're often tied together, which is why at Scout and the Operations Center, we think of cybersecurity as a process. Um, there's no single solution to cybersecurity. No one has a, a key that they can give out and um, make all your worries go away, but more so thinking at a, at a holistic view. You can hear the term layered security all the time, um, making sure defense depth is another one. So, you know, having multiple controls in place to protect yourself against um, today's uh, cyber landscape, yesterday's cyber landscape, and tomorrow's cyber landscape, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, but, you know, that's what our task is in the, cyber, in the uh, security operations center, is to keep up with it all and make sure that we can help keep our partners protected and more so the economy protected from these sorts of threats, like you had mentioned, James. Um, simple things like uh, that we take for granted, gas prices spiking here in the US because of the pipeline being Im impacted with a ransomware attack. Um, even when, as we start to dive into solar winds, think about those sophisticated supply chain attacks, all start with something basic, was a credential based issue. So things like that are, are all things that, you know, sometimes we take for granted and assume we've overcome or moved beyond, but in reality, uh, it's the easiest way for attackers to compromise a system, compromise a network, and really do some damage. So it's a big focus for us in, in the security operations center for sure. Yeah, no, it's a, and it's great to hear your insight because obviously for me, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, <laughs> I think I, I use the phrase to describe myself. Uh, I, I know enough to be dangerous uh, quite a lot. <laughs> But uh, yeah, hearing hearing it from you, it, like there is definitely a lot that we we do, um, and, and a lot that uh, you know we definitely have to take into consideration with cybersecurity, um, you know, and, and the likes of, of different threats and threat types. You know, when you're looking at you know, ransomware, business email compromise, um, you know, SQL injection. It doesn't matter what it is, you know. Um, the, all of these things have the the most devastating impacts these days, which, um, yes, data is king, as they say. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and keeping up with it all is, is the biggest challenge. Um, there are so many different pieces to the puzzle, and um, you got to think about everything that an attacker is thinking about. Like you just said, there could a big attack could start with a simple SQL injection. It could start with someone's credentials being compromised. It could start at the most basic levels. Um, I was out at the RSA conference uh, last year, uh, 2020, and the whole theme of it was the human element, getting to human level. We often think about in technology, we often think about securing systems, securing a firewall, securing a web server, but 
at, at the end of the day, you're really only as strong as your weakest user. So, and that's what attackers know. They, they are, you know, very certain of that. If they can, um, whether it's a, a spear phishing attack, a, a broad phishing campaign, what have you, if they can start with just a, a user falling for a phishing email, clicking on a link or downloading an attachment, that could be it. You know, they won't have to um, scan a firewall, find a vulnerability, uh, execute and exploit, um, then hope they can navigate their way through whatever other controls are in place in terms of IDS, IPS. Um, if they can just find a user who maybe isn't the most tech savvy and doesn't have any sort of um, support in terms of email protection or endpoint protection, what have you, uh, it's a very quick and easy way into an organization and can, like we said, cause a tremendous amount of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, users. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think we next up we have some uh, some pretty cool information around cyber hygiene, um, and this is kind of um, some curated in-house stuff where we're looking at the the most uh, common elements um, that you know we're seeing as being kind of some very um, uh, Pretty very not unique necessarily, but very all-encompassing uh, elements that you should definitely take into consideration. Um, and uh, yeah, Eric, I think I'm going to let you lead some of this. I, I can yeah. just kind of pitch in as and when, because again, dangerous versus intelligent here. So <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Um, I think the first bullet point here is so important and easily taken for granted. Um, establish what you want to protect the most, the data and systems you care about, especially in today's technology world where data is spread out everywhere, right? Um, you have data as simple as on some, on a user's laptop, right? Saved to their local drive. You have data saved to maybe a file server that you have uh, within your network, within your own uh, data center. Or then you have anything that's uh, a vendor might store. You might work with a partner or you might have uh, outsourced something and, and they might be have access to your information, your files, whatever the case may be. And then of course, what's everyone talking about now? Cloud as well. Um, what's in AWS? What's in Azure? And I think that's where things really start to get complicated. Most organizations, I, I bet you if you ask, you don't even know where exactly it's hosted. <laughs> Is it in the US? Is it in Europe? Is it or maybe? Um, once you get into the talk of cloud, things seem to get a little more complicated and uh, a little more foggy. So you really have to inventory of what you have, um, where is it, how is it hosted, and decide what matters to you. So that could vary for every single organization. You know, it really depends on what sector are you in. If you're in the financial sector, maybe one thing's important to you. If you're in the healthcare sector, obviously when you talk about compliance and HIPAA, then you really have a data set that you have to focus on. Or you can mean something completely else. And you know, maybe it's not some credit card or payment data that we're talking about, or you're not storing anyone's PII, but it could be, you know, your own trade secrets or what have you. Um, all of that sort of information um, is something that each organization really has to take inventory and decide what is our top priority, what really uh, do the most to protect and vice versa. What would impact our business the, the worst if um, an attacker was able to compromise that data? So everything when you think about what you want to protect the most really goes back to, in cybersecurity, we talk a lot about the, the CIA triad, um, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality speaks for itself. Uh, that data does not get on the wrong eyes, into the wrong hands. Um, it's confidential integrity, no one has compromised the data in any sort of way. No one has changed any numbers or any information or any files, made any modifications. Uh, you know, it has that integrity. Um, and then of course, availability, that you can access the data when you need the data. That the, for example, ransomware, of course, with data being encrypted, obviously impacts availability or as something as simple as um, if a file server crashes, right? I'm sure many of us have been there before. And then the data isn't backed up and you can no longer access that. What would you do without that data, essentially? Or what would you do if someone modified that data? Or what would happen if someone who wasn't supposed to see that data did have access to it? So thinking about that CIA, CIA triad um, is a really basic way to start, especially with that first bullet point there. Yeah, Anything? absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, it's actually interesting when you, you, one of your points you made during that is like, you know, maybe it's not, you know, uh, medical data, maybe it's not credit card data, but maybe it's kind of, you know, IP, maybe it's stuff that really, you know, holds true to you. There was, um, I'll try not to name the name, um, but you, you may have read about this in the news. There was a game developer that got hit with a pretty nasty ransomware at the end of last year, start of this year, um, I want to say. And um, instead of, you know, uh, going in and just encrypting everything and holding them to ransom, they did that. <laughs> Their critical systems were encrypted very well. Um, but then they also siphoned off uh, unreleased game data, personnel data, um, uh, you know, uh, HR case files and things like that, uh, financial and legal uh, information around the company, tons of IP. Um, and they went in and they were just like, you know, taunting them like, we've got your data. Um, and I, they went in for $100 million. They, they, this ransomware uh, um, uh, organization went in for $100 million against this company, um, which, you know, the, the mind mind boggles with regards to you know having that much money hit your account one day in bitcoin um but you know it, it's it's crazy to think that you know when you start thinking about this when you start thinking about what is what you want to protect most being you know the kind of key point there you know it may not be as simple to say you know oh it's you know my credit card information you know you think of it from a user's perspective it's going to be well i have accounts in literally in places I don't even know I have accounts anymore, things I set up years ago. Um, and maybe in there I, I stored, you know, credit card information, or maybe in there I stored my bank information. You know, maybe it's, uh, you know, a, a password or, or credit card management system that holds all of my passwords and all of my credit card data. Um, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, a text file that I stored in OneDrive that, that has all that information. You know, I, I'm using obviously financial information because that holds true to me. If anyone gets hold of my financial information, um, I think first and foremost, they'll laugh and probably put some money into my account. Um, but, you know, it's something that it, it's, it's terrifying, you know. Um, so it's always interesting to kind of, you know, I always love having the conversation around what is the data you care about? When I'm talking to our partners, customers, I'm like, all right, what, what, what data is it? And it's never the server that, you know, that you think it is. It, there's always one server that just like, if I lose this, my company will go under, um, you know, and it's, it always does something really inconspicuous and obscure, which is, is wonderful. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a really awesome point there, Eric, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was very well said in terms of, you know, figuring out what exactly it is and it varies, of course, for every organization. Um, and then secondly, you want to build concentric rings of security around that data. So this one is pretty straightforward, but requires a lot of thought. Um, so I mentioned earlier, layered security. So say, for example, you, you found that data set, you found what it was that was most important to you. Now you have to think, we have to build around that to make sure that an attacker is really going to have to jump through hoop after hoop after hoop order to um, compromise that. We want to secure it as best we can. So layered security can literally be thought of or imagined as building rings around that data so that if they get through one ring, okay, they still have to get through a second. If they get through a second, they have to get through a third. And that, you know, isn't as straightforward. You know, it's not as simple as saying, okay, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. It really depends on a lot of different factors, such as what is the data? What are we talking about? Where is it stored? How does it need to be accessed, right? Do you, do you need, to, does it need to be publicly available, right? Does it, someone need to have an account or can it just be very, very restricted? So it, it really, that's a big question too. Who needs access to the data and how do they access it? Um, so thinking about things like that, thinking about how you can segment it from the rest of your network, thinking about what controls you could put in place um, thinking about how it's monitored is really important, making sure that you're aware of everything that's going on in terms of that data, what's getting in, what's going out, um, who's accessing it, from where, all those sorts of things, so that at least you know what's happening if something were to. And then, of course, there's always the, the backup plan, right? You need to have backups as well, so that if something did happen to the data, if the availability of that data um, was no longer, that at least you could restore it, access it elsewhere, um, still have an opportunity to salvage the incident rather than being stuck. Um, again, we go back to ransomware, but that's really what it comes down to. 
being stuck forced at, at the mercy of an attacker, forced to, to pay a ransom or start from the ground up. So it's definitely a challenge. And um, like I said, layers to your security, um, not just one thing um, that there's not gonna be one thing that, that keeps all your data protected. Think about um, segmentation, think about multi-factor authentication, think about um, IDS, IPS, think about all of those sorts of things. Least privilege um, is a huge, the principle of least privilege is, is massive in terms of securing your network. And then of course, making sure you have backups available were anything to happen. So that, that's where I at least focus that one. Yep, definitely me too. Um, you know, they, they uh, I think I've heard the analogy of the onion so many times that it just kind of, it's ingrained in my head now to just always think about uh, infrastructure as an onion. Uh, almost picturing it as an onion now as well. And I'm sure in my head somewhere there's a Shrek voice. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, without those concentric rings, it, there's always the potential of something opening up. And, it, you know, we we as cybersecurity professionals, we scream the praises of cybersecurity, uh, not just Scout. You know, we're, we are advocates of people being secure, uh, period. Um, you know, so it's... You know, very it's a it's a very big point to to make sure we labor on unfortunately um but yeah hopefully it helps yeah definitely and then the third point i, I just had touched on a little bit but it is extremely important to realize um you have to know if you have a problem that's why monitoring your network is essential um for example you know time really is money for a lot of our businesses and i'm sure a lot of people on this call um so if aware of something, if you're not aware of data leaking, or if you're not aware of the presence of a malicious actor in your environment, or if you're not aware of a ransomware ticking time bomb ready to, to uh, exploit your entire network, um, then that could go on for a very long time um, before it's finally noticed. And when it is finally noticed, you know, 99% of the time, the damage is already done and it's, it's severe. Um, we'll touch on solar winds, but uh, sunburst, excuse me, in the case of sunburst with solar winds, uh, you know, it's reported that those threat actors had uh, compromised the, the source code up to a year, even more before it was recently discovered. So mm -hmm. thinking about how much they were able to access, the amount of information they were able to obtain, uh, the networks that they were able to have hands on during that time. Uh, they probably still didn't even get around to everything with what they had access to, but um, you need to know as soon as possible what's going on in your network. And that's why having monitoring, um, security monitoring in place is, is absolutely essential. Yep. Yeah, I think if, uh, if I had a, a dollar for every time I said that visibility is key, um, I'd have a lot of money. I don't know how much, <laughs> but yeah, it's de definitely a phrase that uh, I use way too much for sure. Um, yeah. you know, and I think the, the earlier you see it, the, the better it is. I think we you keep me honest, Eric, but we talk about the fact that, you know, the average time for an attacker to be in a network it is about 197 days, um, yeah. before they're found. Um, and I always, you know, kind of caveat that by saying, you know, sometimes the, the finding moment, uh, isn't necessarily finding there's a, an attacker in your network, but it's them releasing a payload. You know, the, the find is bam. Uh, you know, ransomware everywhere, or bam, uh, you know, a, a complete, you know, destruction of, uh, of all system data, you know, uh, um, something ripping through the network and, and deleting data left, right, and center. Um, so, you know, it's definitely key to be able to see these things way early on. You know, if you can capture day one of someone snooping around on the back end of your network, or even earlier than that, trying to get into your network, trying to use illegitimate means to get in. You know there was so much damage mitigation that is, has you know has happened at that point instead of the after effect of damage control where we're, we're thinking about you know the um, restoration of, of uh, systems and the such like from backup and, and so forth which you know i'll never say that backup is a bad thing backup is key <laughs> um but uh you know as it's it, as important as having you know a solid cyber security uh platform if not in tune with it you know i feel like cybersecurity and backup are very much hand in hand they have to work together and they have to be implemented together yeah 
Absolutely. And, that, and what you just said was a great point and leads into the next point here. Um, taking response time down. It's the difference between becoming public or not. Like you said, James, um, the quicker you know about something it could be a matter of reacting or recovering to, to an incident that's already been deployed and infection that's already spread throughout an entire network or in a sense, fighting back, um, you know, containing the incident, um, terminating the malicious actors access to the network, um, whatever needs to be done, whether it's blocking an IP address or disabling an account or removing a machine from the network, all of those things, um, if they're not acted upon quickly can lead to much bigger problems. Um, so knowing what's happening in real time is, is crucial and goes back to that monitoring piece. Um, having you know, security professionals looking at your network uh, 24 seven, 365, um, analyzing threats in real time and making sure they're acted upon is, is critical. Um, even something that waits a matter of minutes or a matter of hours um, at that point is already far too long. And then like you had also said, James, the average attacker is in the network for quite a while. Um, they're doing a lot while they're there. They're not just sitting dormant there. They are planning their attack. They are um, you know, taking a full inventory of everything in the network. Um, they're articulating what exactly they will do. And then sure enough, at the opportune time, um, it's pretty much game over. So responding in a timely manner, um, making sure that as soon as an issue arises, it is addressed uh, with the top priority is, is definitely crucial as well. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, when we look at it from kind of like, uh, um, you know, why that is so important, you, you kind of have so many aspects, you, you covered off so much in there, but you have so many aspects to take into consideration. Um, and I think the biggest worry, um, you know, especially for me when I was was working as part of small startups uh, back in the UK and things like that, um, when you're in the small startup phase, uh, uh, one piece of bad press or one piece of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, terrible tabloid will be the death of you. You know, the word of mouth and the 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 power of of bad press, it, you know, it can shut a business down. Um, so, you know, if you can if you can take the response time down and, and remove the element of it going public, um, you know, at that point you have the potential to not only you know save you today and and save the the company from like a today perspective. You know, everyone's back to work. You know, the the cybersecurity event or the breach, whatever it may be, has been solved. But the long term effects and the long term ramifications will also ha um, be mitigated. You know that. That, uh, that downstream effect of, you know, a, uh, a particularly nasty breach today, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever it may be, days, weeks, months down the road, um, you know, could mean that, you know, people are still talking about it and people are still kind of bringing that up and saying, oh, you probably don't want to work with that company that, you know, they they have the, uh, they, or they, they lose customer data pretty regularly. They, they get hacked a lot. Um, you know, from a one-time event potentially that you know will cause all of that bad press. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a definitely a key point for sure there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, lastly, is something I'm sure we we hear a lot about now and today is cyber framework, um, and there are many of them. Right. There's uh, CMMC is a big one that's being talked about now here in the U.S. Um, you have the MITRE framework, you have even from Lockheed Martin, things like Cyber Kill Chain. Um, and one of the biggest ones which you see listed here is NIST. Um, but the framework, you know, they're all great. None of them are perfect, um, but they really help you build a foundation in terms of your security coverage. Um, and what you wanna be thinking about, and this is something that our SOC, our everything at Scout is, is built around this triad here, which is people, process and technology. Those are the main th three categories that you can kind of um, structure your organization and your security around. So people, we talked a lot of it, a lot about, you know, specifically with uh, phishing attacks, protecting their inboxes, protecting their data as well, protecting their endpoints. Where are they accessing your network from? Is it their phone? Is it their personal laptop? Do they have an iPad? All of those things um, kind of tie together with component, what are your users actually doing, right? Um, process, 
what do you have in place? Um, how, how, what does your workflow look like? You know, like what think of what an attacker would think if they can um, break your process somewhere. What would it do to to the rest of your organization? Or if they can um, find their way into your process somewhere, where can they go from there? So think about all your processes. Are they are they at risk? Are there any vulnerabilities in your process? Are there any weak points from a security perspective? And then of course your technology, which we talked about, um, all your different systems. Um, your firewall, for example, what, what's vulnerable to what exploits, what new CVs are out there, all of those different sorts of things. Um, keeping your technology secure is just as important, right? You don't want to let someone just walk in through a, a weak firewall policy or a web server that hasn't been patched in forever or anything like that. Um, so yeah, people process technology is huge in what we talk about a lot. And then specifically with NIST, um, we found that, you know, it, Organizations that use NIST tend to have built a, a really strong foundation for their cybersecurity coverage. Um, NIST does a really great job in setting the standard in terms of um, making it simple for organizations to cover everything and make sure they have everything covered. Um, and we actually, in, in our security operations center, have aligned our um, use cases and our alert uh, runbooks to NIST standards. So. When our analysts are investigating security incidents and when they are issuing security alerts to our partners, um, there is definitely a component of NIST that's taken into that in terms of what the threat is, what exactly we're talking about here, what the impact could be, of course, where, where could this spread to, and what are the recommendations, what needs to be done um, in kind of two phases. What, what are the immediate actions that need to be taken to uh, you know, remediate this incident? And um, long-term as well, what are the lessons learned from something like this that say a, a new technology or a new feature needs to be implemented or um, we need to look at things like least privilege, what are the, the long-term projects that need to be taken into account um, to prevent this sort of thing from happening again? And like I said, NIST is a great way, looking at the NIST framework is a great way to do that for your organization is to align everything you have and starts from the top too, thinking about your data, building concentric rings, making sure we're monitoring, minimizing response time, all of that stuff kind of ties into these frameworks um, that really make sure your organization is covered from a security perspective. For sure. Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I have nothing intelligent to add to that. <laughs> you, uh, you, you covered it off so well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's again, great for you to, to take us through kind of that thought process, Eric, around kind of, especially that triad we talk about, the, the people process the technology, um, you know, making sure we're covering all our bases um, and using um, the, you know, the industry standards that have already been built for us to, to make sure that we're, you know, top notch and top tier with our, our cybersecurity for sure. Absolutely. And then, yeah, so I guess we could dive into a little bit about Sunburst and, and how it impacted solar winds and beyond, really. Um, but for anyone who may not be familiar, which I'm sure we all are, um, just a, a few months ago, well, actually, it was longer, about six months ago now, um, it was announced that solar winds had experienced a major breach with their RMM. Um, it was a supply chain attack, meaning that the threat actors um, compromised the an update for the uh, product. Um, no one was aware of it, so it looked like a legitimate update when you, you applied the update to uh, the solution. And then, long behold, by applying that update, because the source code was compromised, um, you just established a backdoor for threat actors, which at this point we believe were nation state actors from Russia, unconfirmed, but. Uh, there's evidence that points to that. Um, so, of course, we talk about all of the different organizations that were impacted because of this, right? Nobody knew about it. So, um, to endpoint protections, for example, this looks like a legitimate update, nothing to flag. This looks like SolarWinds signed the update, uh, signed the certificate to say that this is okay. Um, so, no endpoint protection is going to block it. Nobody's going to think twice about it. Um, as far as we're all concerned, this is how things should behaving, be behaving. So major players in, in the tech space in terms of Cisco, Microsoft, AT&T, VMware, all these organizations were impacted. And then on the government side, you have 
just about every department it felt like. Uh, Department of Defense, Department of State, NASA, the major players were all using SolarWinds r and And then in our space with our partners, of course, uh, SolarWinds is uh, you know, frequent use for MSPs um, all around the world. So this was obviously a, a major incident. And um, before I dive too much in, James, is there any the high level stuff that I, that I maybe missed? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, a supply chain attack, it, it's always looking at, you know, the, the ramifications of what else it does, you know, um, and, and especially the, the sunburst attack. Um, this is kind of where we start thinking about the, um, uh, the wider scale of, of what um, an RMM solution can do, does, is. Um, you know, and the data it holds, I think it is one of the key things, um, you know, the amount of MSPs I speak to, um, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, who, you know, every single one of them, you know, uses RMM pretty much, you know, the, it, it, it's just a needed thing these days, you know, an RMM solution makes everyone's lives easier. But we look at the flip side of it and we start thinking, all right, well, what does that RMM solution have access to? literally everything you know it is uh, the, the, the amount of times i've heard it referred to as you know the keys to the castle uh, quite literally you know it holds the keys the passwords the ip addresses the sensitive information um that has the potential to not only um you know if we look at like a, a in this case this is a kind of supply chain attack when we're at the top level so solar winds you know, the the potential ramifications for them alone are humongous for a company perspective. But then you've got all the companies underneath, you know, the managed service providers that use uh, an RMM solution like that. And then underneath there, all the customers that will have the RMM agents installed on their servers and laptops and desktops and, you know, all of that data living in one singular place. It's... Um, it's it's terrifying, you know, and and that's why you know supply chain attacks they take the longest time to set up. I would I would hazard a guess, and Eric, you you probably have more knowledge than me here, but I would hazard a guess that supply chain attacks are probably one of the most complicated attack types to set up because there are so many elements that you have to take into consideration, so much reconnaissance, so much you know, diving into the company and, and figuring out the correct attack vector. And in this case, you know, that, that update was the chosen route for them to take. But, you know, these nation state actors or supposed nation state actors that set this up, I'm sure that the reconnaissance behind this, as much as, you know, we saw this six months or so ago, I'm sure this, this happened, you know, even further in advance than that, we, you know, six months to a year, potentially even further before that, when they started gathering intelligence, started piecing together how the the most, you know, unfortunately, one of the most perfect supply chain attacks that you know we've probably seen in a very long time, um, to you know rip through all of these systems and you know cause one of the biggest disruptions um, to our industry that we've seen in you know in in ages for sure. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I think. Um, in terms of what we're talking about here, this particular supply chain attack, could you could argue that, and I, I bet you a lot of people will, myself included, that this was the most sophisticated and highest impact uh, cybersecurity attack that has ever occurred in, in the history of technology. I think um, some of the some security experts estimate by the time that all the dust settles and, and all the forensics is done, it's estimated that over 100,000 unique organizations will have been impacted by this one single supply chain attack, which is massive when you think about that. Yeah. Um, usually attacks are limited to um, one organization, or maybe if it's an MSP, you're talking about uh, 10, 100, maybe that's it. Um, but to think about 100,000 unique organizations um, impacted by one single attack is, yeah, far and away the most successful that we've ever heard of and probably for a while, but, you know, because of the success of it too, it's a motivator for other nation state actors, for other threat groups. Um, there are so many different uh, attack groups, malicious actors out there that will now say, look at what was achieved here. Um, look at 
able to be done. Look at how much data was accessed. Look at, um, and we still don't know everything that, that, that was accessed. We're still learning, but um, it will definitely be used as a motivator to, to try to move on to the next big thing. A lot of hackers, especially, they, they work based on reputation. Particularly when you get into the dark web, you need to have a reputation as an attacker to access certain forms and certain um, data sets and certain tools. Um, so a lot of them are driven by reputation. And being able to accomplish something on this scale, or not even on this scale, just because this scale is so grand, um, but something similar um, will definitely be a motivator for a lot of threat groups going forward. Um, so there's, there's the data piece of it, there's the finance piece of it, there's the pure reputation piece of it. There's a lot that will probably lead to us seeing similar things, um, which kind of goes back to tying it together, what we're talking about earlier, making, making sure that you know what data is most important to your organization in case of this particular attack, the, the compromised data set was the source code for this update for the RMM tool. Um, so making sure you have layered security centric rings around that so that an attacker would really have to, you know, they breach the first wall, they'd have to breach a second and a third and a fourth and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it, it's things like that, that we talked about before that really could make a difference in something like this. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's interesting when we talk about kind of the severity of this and the fact that it is going to spur on other organizations to, to look into, you know, how they do things and, you know, what the next, you know, stupidly heinous uh, act of, of cyber uh, larceny or, you know, however you want to uh, uh, coin it is going to happen. And <clears throat> internally here, we're, um, it, it, this is going to sound incredibly sensationalist and I truly don't mean it to be this, this way, but we're actually coining the term cyber Armageddon more and more. Just for the simple fact of, you know, um, to Eric, to your point, like, you know, this is, you know, you being a, a cybersecurity expert yourself, you know, saying that this is one of the, if not the worst attack we've ever seen, you know, it's just going to lead to more. Absolutely. You know, the, the next group out there, the next, um, you know, set of individuals that want to make a name for themselves and want to, uh, you know, cause disruption are going to go, how can we go bigger? How can we, how can we do that better? Um, you know, and I think it, it's, it's going to get to a point where we have some serious, you know, this was bloody serious <laughs> as it started, but we're going to see even more serious events happening, you know, and um, I always look at it from like, you know, what's, what's the worst case scenario with this attack, with the Sunburst attack, you know, pretty much every branch of the US government was touched by this. Um, that has the potential, you know, of bringing a country to its knees, um, you know, depending on what these threat nation state actors, our supposed nation state actors, um, you know, it, it wants to do with it, you know, but you see some of the names on there, you know, when you start looking at US Air Force, the Department of, of Justice and the Department of Defense, um, the CDC, you know, it, it, one attack leads into another, leads into another, leads into another, and all of a sudden the country is not only shut down, but, you know, the uh, uh, weapons and arsenals that are held behind lock and key are no longer as secure as, as we may want them to be, um, you know, uh, and it really does, you know, the snowball effect, um, really is kind of uh, terrifying there and it, you know it kind of leads into the idea of you know what you know uh, what else you know what's next which is cyber armageddon um you know which uh again it, it may sound crazy but you know the amount of attacks that we're seeing and our soccer seeing right eric uh on a daily basis it is definitely uh increasing over time yeah without a doubt it's it's been a tremendous volume of incidents and data leakage and everything across the board um feels like over the past six months it's definitely heightened um yeah. slow down anytime soon so um being prepared for it is is the biggest thing um knowing what you have in place knowing what is where in terms of your organization and having a plan having uh, an incident response plan having uh, business continuity plan, having a disaster recovery plan, all those sorts of things. And like we said earlier, of course, aligning to a framework um, to be ready if, if something were to happen. Because at this point in 
the world, you know, in the cyber landscape today, it really, when you talk about cybersecurity and cyber attacks, it's more of a question of when, not if, will my organization be impacted or be targeted at least. Um, you know, at, at the most basic level, attackers are scanning the entire internet every single day, trying to find an open port, trying to find a vulnerability, trying to find something that they can exploit. And, um, you know, it's just being prepared for when your organization is going to be targeted and making sure that you have all the necessary controls in place to um, either keep that attack out entirely or be prepared and so that it's, it's limited, it's reacted to quickly, there's no major damage, and everything's operating smoothly. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, now, I know that we only have uh, eight minutes left in our allotted time today, and uh, I, I just want to kind of pause here for a second and say thank you everyone for for you know bearing with us through all that that's you know eric and i are being you know ethically nerdy as we are um you know this stuff is is incredibly interesting for us so you know we could talk literally for hours about this and uh, uh internally uh here at scout we regularly do in, in various slack rooms and things like that but um yeah i guess at this point uh, we'll uh open it up and, uh, and take some questions. And Michael, I think you're going to help us out with that. Yes, thank you, guys. Um, very informative and very scary at the same time. Um, so obviously, you've, you've, you've spoken a little bit about the NIST and other frameworks that are available to help secure your own systems or guidelines and steps that can be taken to secure your own systems. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, especially from a in the marketplace there's a lot of thought process that people think well these guys aren't going to target me and that's very often the case that they're not targeting you but they get you because of how things work out so i guess um if we if we narrow the focus down a little bit more and we're like all right what can i do um one of the issues and one of the concerns i have is say for example i work with an outsourced company to manage my payroll and HR, what are the questions that I can be asking or what are, what are the, the processes I can implement in my business that I can ensure that the outsourced company I'm working with are following you know, an acceptable security practice to, to prevent my data that I entrust them with from being leaked out and being used, um, used against like identity theft because that personally, personally identifiable information is is very important, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I think there there are two kind of uh, ways to think about this. One is from a technical perspective, and then one is just from a process perspective. So, from the technical perspective, with all third party vendors and contracts, and, uh, sort of integrations that have have access to your data, your organization's data, or your network directly. Um, always, always, always follow the principle of least privilege. Um, they get as minimal access as possible. Um, obviously, like you said, in this specific example, um, they do have a lot of access with PII, um, but make sure that they can't access any systems that they shouldn't be able to segment it properly so that even if something happened, that's what you're focused on, right? In this case, it is kind of big PII, but um, at least they're not reaching any other components of the network that could lead to bigger disasters. Yes. So least privilege, definitely, um, from the technical perspective. And then from the process perspective, um, we always say, be curious and question everything. And um, we recommend this to our the organizations we work with as well, and of course, our partners. Um, ask questions, ask what they're, ask to see their, their incident response plan, ask to see what controls they have in place. You can even go as far as um, when you're establishing a contract with a vendor to build in a component of vendor due diligence where you can actually have a third party come assess their security posture and make a determination whether they are in a good spot or whether they have some, some weak areas that they need to improve or some additional controls they need to implement um, or if there's anything that you, know, you can be doing differently to help them stay secure. So, I think those are definitely the two things I would say. Least privilege, always, always, always. And then um, making sure that you're asking the right questions, showing, making sure they prove that they have uh, prioritized security properly and that your relationship, whatever sort of connection it is that they have to, to your organization um, will ultimately be secured. 
Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I know that a lot for people that know me and, and know what I do, like one of the one of the very few questions I personally get asked is what data do I collect? How do I store it? And um, you know, what do I do with it? So I think it's I think it's important to understand what data is out there of yours um, that that people have access to and what are they doing with it. So it's a huge thing. I mean, and it's, it's such a small thing in this bit scope of things, but all of a sudden you're working with 10, 15, 20 different vendors and they all have different segments of your data and, and what happens if that gets out there. So um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware of a company locally uh, in Australia recently that had a pretty big ransomware attack. And again, it turned out that they were in the system, as you said, you know, it was 160 days average, you're saying, um, of, of, you know, infiltrating the network before they release the payload um you know these people got access to uh their internal systems they had access to the pii uh right to work documents so they had they had copies of people's passports driver's license and and everything so ask yeah make sure you ask the right questions and get access to or know what they will how they secure or how they attempt to secure this information that you're providing them yeah Absolutely. I think from, from my side of things as well, just kind of piggybacking on that, um, you know, when we start looking at, you know, what questions can we, can we ask these vendors? What, you know, how, how deep can we go? You know, what, uh, what question is too far within that? I, I don't think there is one, you know, if these organizations are going to be looking after your data, if they're going to be uh, touching your IP, if they're going to be doing any level of, you know, um, uh, storage of anything that you deem to be critical, you ask them whatever you want, um, you know, you, you go yes. ham on them. You, you make sure that they are protected up to the eyeballs and then some, um, not just on the, uh, you know, on the backup side of things, make sure that, you know, if they have a breach or if they have a, a deletion event that they can restore your data, but making sure that they are fully covered with regards to people not being able to access their, their servers. And on the flip side, you know, seeing policies and guidelines that do cover you know, should a breach happen, you have a set amount of time to tell me about it. Um, because that could be the difference between someone, you know, say it's credit card information, the, you know, the, the time frame taken could be the difference between someone getting the mm -hmm. data, getting access to the credit card and stealing money, or just getting the credit card and it's, you know, already it's been disabled. It's, you know, the credit card no longer exists. All right. So, I mean, yeah, no, there's a, a, that's a good point. And I know like in Australia, we have a, a, a government initiative, a, a notifiable data breach where there are those things in place. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you have um, had a breach where, you know, it's deemed to be notifiable, you have a certain amount of time to notify both the government and the parties involved. Um, and there's very big fines if you do not, and you try to hide this information. So uh, we have a couple of minutes left and there is another question that Jason has just submitted through. And he's basically saying, uh, should MSPs stop using tools as a crutch, allowing them to avoid increase in skills? At what point do these tools threaten to cause more problems than they solve? Um, That's a good question. I, I can kick that one off. And that is such a, a challenging question where we draw the line between efficiency and security, right? Uh, in the security world, we always joke about the developer whose job is to make things as easy as possible. And, and what we often see is developers will be the ones who are playing around with ports and opening everything up and making it nice and easy so that the user can access exactly what they need and they won't hear any complaints. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, as we know, that's, that's not the best practice from a security perspective. But anyway, talking about specific tools, um, you know, I think it wouldn't be fair to, to make an ass assessment that um, just because a tool has a certain level of access or, or fulfills a certain role, um, it shouldn't be used because if an attacker were to breach it, uh, it, it, would, it wouldn't end well, like we saw with solar winds. Um, I think it wouldn't be necessarily realistic to remove those sorts of items from our technology stack. Um, it would make things very challenging. Um, and in the end, we probably what we see happen sometimes is someone tries to, to make their own solution in house, which just leads to more vulnerabilities and more holes in the network. Um, so I think that, you know, that's that's my opinion, at least, is that we shouldn't stop using the tools just because 
we've seen an issue like solar winds. Um, you know, it solar winds actually did the right thing by reporting it and letting everybody know and being very upfront. Here is exactly what happened, um, and you know, addressing it quickly. Well, as soon as they found out about it, at least. So, in my opinion, I would say, uh, you know, the, the tools that we use to uh, service our customers should still be used. Um, might just, I think, what we're going to see now is a lot more regulation with certain things. Uh, specifically, here in the U.S., for example, there's already been um, political debate and uh, new laws implemented around what organizations need to do make sure that they are protecting the, the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses that um, are really relying on them to, to take the right steps and to do their due diligence in terms of security. So that's sure. my opinion. Um, keep, keep using the tools and, you know, make sure we're doing the right thing, you know, asking our vendors what exactly they're doing um, and working together as a security community to keep ourselves and our customers and our partners protected. So I guess um, the last comment I would pick out have before we wrap this up, as we have just got, we just hit the one hour mark from the late start. But uh, I, I'm sort of seeing a lot of a lot of drive from this locally coming from the insurance sector, where insurance companies are now starting to refuse policies to either MSPs or, or other businesses where they don't have the processes in place to respond to these sort of events. Do you think that's the way it's going to head down and that's going to cause a lot of the drive for people to, to start focusing on this? Yeah, James, I could take it or you could take that one. Yeah, how about it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, insurance especially is going to be a major thing. And now we're seeing cyber insurance be talked about more and more. And if you look at a, a cyber insurance policy, which is now kind of like you had said, Michael, baked into a standard coverage that, that you might receive outside of cyber insurance, what um, controls are you taking? They're kind of doing their own due diligence before we offer you um, some sort of coverage. We wanna make sure that you are doing everything you can or, or at least what you should be doing uh, to keep yourself protected. So I agree that will definitely drive organizations to take a better, take a step back, reevaluate their security and say, hey, we need to have this sort of stuff or we're not even going to be able to get an insurance policy yep. signed. Um, so I, I think we will see more of that. I think you're definitely right. Yeah. Uh, so some of the insurance policies I've seen, uh, especially around cyber insurance, have been very, very vaguely worded. And they, yeah. again, you know, it's insurance and they, they, they might just turn around and say, well, you need a firewall. Um, and a firewall could be as simple as like a, a modem that has some port blockings or restrictions on it or something as complex as got intrusion prevention um, mechanisms involved in it. So they're not really defining that yet. Um, and I think that's still a lot of that is coming on to the end user. So being aware of this um, definitely helps. Yeah. So look, thank you to you both of you, Eric and, and James, um, for presentation today uh really good information and um i think we can end it there unless anybody has any further questions no all right thanks again guys and um hope to see you soon Great. thank you everyone thanks everyone